Thank you, Jesus. I want to say happy birthday, Jesus. I want to wish all of you a merry, a very merry Christmas. Today, as we look up, as we look to this God who left his heavenly throne, God needed to take human form to operate in this earth on our behalf. And he planned it before the world began. First Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest. God was revealed, not incarnated, in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up to glory. Our God, our God, the God of the entire universe, Jehovah Yahweh, the self-existent one, Jehovah Bor, the one who created us, Elohim, the creator, he left his heavenly throne. He used a body of a human, a little girl, Mary. The Bible says in John 1, 14, the word, the logos became flesh. And that's how God operated. And today, by golly, by gosh, he operates the same way. He uses us, humans. And just as he protected Mary, he protected Mary all through what she had to go through, just the same way. As we look at this Christmas story, we can see God's hand protecting us. God protected Mary, and he used Joseph. He even used her parents. Matthew 1, 18 tells us, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, before they consummated their marriage sexually, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. So here was this young girl, pregnant and not married. The Bible tells us in the book of Luke chapter 1 that the power of the Holy Ghost came upon her, hovered upon her, and placed that baby in her womb. God came to earth in human form. He came to give us life, but not just life. Not just give us life, but give us life abundantly. John 10, the second part of verse 10, tells us in Jesus' words, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And so God protected Mary and protected Joseph and protected the baby Jesus ultimately and so God will protect you he will use whosoever whatever it takes to protect you but we've got a counter fate 
we've got a counterfeit. You see, just like God doesn't operate in this earth without that human form, Jesus, so Satan had to have a body to operate. He's a counterfeit. He cannot operate legally in the earth without a human body. And he will use anyone, any person. He'll even use the one who loves the Lord with all their heart if they let their guard down. John 10.10 10. The beginning part of it tells us the thief, Satan, comes not but to kill, I'm sorry, it starts with to steal, to kill, and destroy. He cannot do anything else. That's who Satan is, a thief. He's a destroyer. He's a murderer. John 8, 44 tells us, you are of your father, the devil. This is Jesus speaking. And Jesus is speaking to those Pharisees and the ones who don't believe. I'm turning my phone off because it's constantly interrupting. So here, Jesus came to give us life, but we had the counterfeit, the imitator, comes to give us everything that's the opposite of what God wants for us. And so Jesus is speaking in John 8, 44, and he tells the people, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, you are, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and live not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. So here Jesus tells us who the devil is. He will steal your destiny if you let him. He will destroy your testimony if you let him and destroy your very life. His ultimate goal is to kill your potential, kill your future, and kill you. His ultimate goal is to cause you to end up in hell separated from the God who loves you enough to leave heaven, to come to earth in a lowly atmosphere just to save us, to become one of us to save us. How does he work? He murders through abortion, through slandering people's names, murdering their reputation, murdering their potential. He works through gossip. He works through hate. He works through bitterness. The, water, the Bible tells us in James 3.10, sweet and bitter water cannot come out of the same fountain. So I want to warn you today, encourage you today, plead with you today as you come into this season where the enemy has made sure there's a lot of stress, there's a lot of lack, there's a lot of regrets, there's a lot of pain. We have to make sure that we're not like the the sixth graders I teach, living in our emotions, doing whatever our emotions dictate. James 3, 10 to 12 says, 
Does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet and bitter water? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Either can the vine bear figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh water. We are that fountain of life. The Bible tells us out of our bellies will come rivers of living water. So at this time, beloved, we have to be aware that there is a counterfeit. But we also have to be more aware that this one who left his heavenly throne to come to earth as a lowly baby boy through very lowly and meek circumstances, he didn't come as a king he didn't come majestically. He came in a lowly manger through lowly, a lowly couple that he chose. And we've got to understand that because he lives in us, greater is he that is in us than the enemy that is in the world. If you are going through a time of difficulty, a time where somebody, I was, I was, I didn't plan to eavesdrop in the dollar store. I went yesterday to pick up some gift bags. And these two ladies, one behind me, one in front of me, were talking. And the one said, yeah, what she said was surely not right. And the next one says, yes. But you know what? I'm not going to stoop to her level. I'm a Christian, and I'm going to act like it. And I jumped in and said, yes, at this time, we have to be so aware of the enemy's activities. And we have to choose not to live in our emotions. And we have to choose to do things God's way. And listen to me. The best revenge, the best gift, that we can give to our God, who gives all to us. The best gift that we can give him is the soul of a human that he died for. So that one that's irritating you, go in the bathroom, go in a quiet corner, forgive them and give them to Christ and ask Christ to send his angels after them to change them they're being used by satan don't you allow the devil to use you to do the same in return so in this hour i want to warn you be watchful your adversary roams around seeking whom he may devour whom he may use for his evil schemes. Remember, he has to have a body to do his evil work for him. First Peter 5, 8 tells us, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, see, there's a counterfeit again. He's acting like a roaring lion. He's not the lion. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So he's walking around, roaming around. Remember in the book of Job, God asked Satan, where have you been? And he said, I've been roaming the earth, going to and fro. He's watching, looking for an entrance to send his little emissaries in to attack you and to use you for his glory. So 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober. Be, be vigilant, be watchful, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour, whom you resist steadfast in the faith. Resist the devil, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. James tells us, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And the way you resist him, James also tells us, we draw near to Christ. 
and Christ will draw near to us. And then in that empowerment, we resist the devil and he'll flee from us. So here it says, be sober. At this time of the year, it's when people have a tendency to not be sober. They have a tendency to, to inebriate. They have a tendency to take on another spirit that is not the Holy Spirit. You ever wonder why alcohol is called spirits? You take on something that controls you. Be sober, not only in your use of alcohol, but be sober in your use of who you follow. Make sure you're following the Holy Spirit. You're listening to the Holy Spirit. He'll tell you. This morning, I got to tell on myself, this morning as I was finishing up my prayer, the alarm went off at 6 o'clock and it woke my husband up. And sometimes he wakes up so cheerful. And I'm, I'm not always cheerful. I'm not a cheerful waker-upper. He is. He wants to wake up and ask all kinds of questions. Or he made a big joke. And I have one of my family members who's upset with him for something he said in a joking way. Though he was serious about what he was encouraging. But anywho, that's just who he is. But I was coming out of a prayer about something that upset me. That I didn't talk to him about yet. Something that I saw from somebody else that upset me I was just coming off that prayer and he makes his jokes of course and then he said so we're leaving Tuesday morning right yes what time are we leaving and I responded Chris really in a very rude way just two words I said two words Chris really but I said it in such a rude way that immediately it changed his mood. And so we have to be careful when we are in our emotions that we are watchful. Because the enemy will use sometimes just one word that we say, just one word, to change the atmosphere. And that's what he delights in. Of course, I apologized to my husband before I left for church because I realized even though I only said two words, Chris, really? It wasn't what he expected. It wasn't what he deserved because he was being cheerful. So we have to be watchful, sober, vigilant. It continues to tell us in 1 Peter 5.10 the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after you have suffered a while, will make you perfect. He'll establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So even in the two words I messed up, I still have hope. I still have hope that as we continue our journey together today, especially specifically for the Christmas season, that my husband would have forgiven me for being ugly, being mean, undeservingly so. So we have so much hope, so much hope. So I want to encourage you, not only be watchful, but also have this thankful heart. I've made up my mind. I don't care what anybody gives me. My way of being thankful to God, my way of being happy 
is giving. So I'm going to give you something regardless. Some people misunderstand my giving. But I'm just a giver. Just when my husband likes to make jokes, that's just who he is. I like to give. That's just who I am. So I've made up my mind. I don't care if nobody gives me anything. And anyways, whatever they give me, I'm just going to use it to re-gift. Because I'm a giver. And I have to have a bag of things to give. And I haven't had one in a while since my daughter stopped living at, at us. Because she's a buyer. And so she'll have all these things that I can collect so I can give. But she's not there. And so I have to have me a, a bag of things to give. So, so we need to be thankful for what we've got. Be thankful for who is with us. Be thankful just because we're breathing. But more than ever, be thankful for the one who we are celebrating in this season. And you who claim you don't celebrate, stop expecting gifts. You don't celebrate Christmas, so okay then. Don't expect any gifts. Don't be upset when you don't get gifts because you don't celebrate Christmas. Colossians 3.15 tells us, let the peace of God rule in your heart. Let peace rule, not strife, not unforgiveness, not bitterness, not fear, not envy, not unthankfulness, but let peace, not the world's peace, not your idea of peace, but God's peace. Remember, he is the prince of peace, the prince of Irene, the prince of Shalom. Let that rule in your hearts. It says that's what we are called in one body. We are called as Christians in one body, God's body. Imagine if your body is hurting, your foot is hurting, your head is hurting. I mean, it throws you off. It's the same way we're all Christians. We are his body. So we need to be in unity, in peace with each other. And be you thankful. Be you thankful. One of the things that you must do if you have to do it 10,000 times this weekend, it's cast your cares on him. He wants you to do that. He is able to handle it. He says in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all, notice that word all, all in any language, all in any nation means all. Casting all. All your care upon him. What care do you have right now? Is it a care that you don't have enough? Remember the loaves and the fish. How he caused it to multiply. And you expect him to multiply what you have this weekend. What is your care? Is it because somebody's missing from the table? Remember. The good times you had together. If you can call them, if you can Skype them, videotape, whatever, do it. If they're dead, are they in heaven? We'll see them again. Comfort yourself. Cast that care on him. What are you worried about? Are you worried about somebody coming to the house who is not going to act right? Prepare your heart for that. Prepare your heart. You are not going to argue. You are not going to fret. You are not going to put them down. You are just going to smile, tap them on the back, and if it gets too much, you're going to run to the bedroom, run to the toilet, and pray. Choose to let peace rule in your heart. Cast all your cares on him for he cares for you. What are you worried about? Not enough money? You're afraid of 
the, the bills that are coming in, remember what he says. He will supply all your need according to his riches. Not your riches, but his riches. And he owns everything. And we're joint heir with him. So we worry about nothing. Cast them upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober. And that's where it goes on to tell us, be sober, be vigilant. And it also tells us that we must know that the same afflictions are accomplished in our brethren that are in the world. So it's not that we alone are going through whatever we're going through. Somewhere in the word of God, you'll see somebody who's gone through it and conquered it. Somewhere in the world, many have gone through what you're going through and conquered it through Christ. He said his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight to 20. Take my yoke upon you. And here's the thing about a yoke. You look it up. When a yoke is upon the neck of two oxen, if they don't walk together, if they don't walk in the same direction, they can break each other's neck. The thing about a yoke is that you have to walk with the person, he says, take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, so that's the heart that we begin to develop, as we take his yoke upon us, as we learn of him through his word, revealed by his Holy Spirit, he is meek, he is lowly in heart, so he doesn't go, yeah, nah, 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 nah. And if you do, you stop, repent, apologize. I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Not you, maybe you will. No, you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Imagine that. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. And he tells us, Take it upon us. Pick up your cross and follow him. And this is how we need to be this weekend, especially if we claim it's his birthday. Think of these that you're passing through as light afflictions. Second Corinthians 4, 17 to 18 says, For our light affliction, none of us will ever go through what Christ went through before the cross, as they beat him, as they plucked his beard out, as they slapped him, smacked him, blindfolded him, and then asked him, who smacked you? Hit him in the head. All that they did to him stripped his back so his flesh hung like pieces of ribbon. We'll never go through any of that. And the worst thing is, he did not deserve it. He did it for us. We deserve it. So whatever we're going through, it's light compared to what he went through. The Bible says, we didn't resist to blood. He did. And he said not a word because he did it for us. Our light affliction which is but for a moment. This too will pass. It's but for a moment, even though it feels terrible at the time. It's but for a moment because we've taken his yoke upon us, because we've cast our care upon him, because we're allowing his peace to rule in our heart. It's only going to be for a moment, but it's going to work for us a far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. So what's coming as you conquer that thing through him because he conquered it and because he, the conqueror, lives in us. We are more than conquerors, Romans 8 tells us. We're not just conquerors, but we're more than conquerors. And so he says, while we look 
not at the things which are seen. Stop focusing on all the things that you're seeing, the lack, the strife, the bills, the absence of loved ones. Don't focus on that. Don't focus on the things that you can see, but focus instead on the things that you cannot see because those things are eternal. The fact that he's there flagging you on, you've, you're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses encouraging you on. Don't focus on the things that you can see. The things that you see are temporary. They're temporal but the things that you cannot see are eternal. So I want to encourage you this day, this day, that is Christmas Eve, even though Jesus was not born at this time, he was born, and we choose to celebrate him now. We choose to celebrate his birth. This El Shaddai, the mighty God, he chose to be Emmanuel, God with us. He chose to be Jehovah Shama, the God who is there. And I'm decreeing and declaring over you, Jehovah Shama, the God who is there with you in whatever you are dealing with. So I'm going to go down now to read the Christmas story to you. Let your hearts be encouraged. Let your hearts be encouraged. 700 years before the birth of Jesus, the prophet Isaiah declared and announced in Isaiah 7 and 14, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That Emmanuel means God with us. He goes on to say in Isaiah 9, verse 6 to 7, For unto us a child is born. See, he's seeing it. 700 years before it happened, he saw it. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it, to establish Establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts performed this. He hovered over the one he chose, Mary, and birthed himself, planted himself in her womb. To become one of us, to die for us, to live for us, to live through us. This God, hallelujah. Let's look at Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 18. Luke chapter 2, as we come down to the end of our message today, let's read the story of Jesus. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 to 18. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be taxed with 
Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. That's how God operates. Imagine when she is very, very, very pregnant. The governor, the, the, the establishment called a decree. Every man, go to your town where you were born because you're going to be taxed. I mean, things happen to us and we think, God, why? He has a plan and a purpose. And that's what I want you to see today. Jesus had to be born in Bethlehem. It was prophesied. It was planned before the foundations of the earth. She wasn't in Bethlehem. When she became pregnant, she was not in Bethlehem. And God needed her to get to Bethlehem for the baby to be born in Bethlehem. Now, Caesar Augustus could have sent that decree out when she was three months pregnant, but that would be too soon. Five months pregnant would have been too soon, but as she was very pregnant, he sent the decree out. So now she's got to travel on a donkey and by foot all the way to Bethlehem. From Galilee, verse 6 of Luke chapter 2. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day, in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. And God chose lowly shepherds to announce the birth of his son. First, lowly shepherds. The birth of his son in an animal's feeding trough. And it shows us, he reaches out to all of us, to whomsoever. We don't have to be high and mighty, educated, rich, well set for him to touch us. He will touch us from the lowliest, to the highest. Hallelujah. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. That's the clothes that they will wipe down the animals with. Verse 13 of Luke 2. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And I want to tell you, this is something the shepherds will never forget. And so the same way, God is going to encounter you this weekend in a way that you will never forget. Allow him to encounter you to change your life forever. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them, verse 15, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. And they came with haste 
and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they had seen, when they had seen it, I lost my place. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which told them, which was told them concerning the child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. When something good happens, you can't help but tell it, even if people may not believe it. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen and heard as it was told unto them. And when eight days were accomplished, for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. That's where we get christening our children from. We present them to the Lord to be blessed. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that opened the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord. And he came by the Spirit into the temple where the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law. Then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you've prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him, and Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and the rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And wasn't that so? How our heart was pierced when our son was crucified. But it was done so the hearts of many will be revealed. Verse 36 of Luke 2, and there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity, and she was a widow of about four score and four years, which did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in in that instant give thanks likewise unto the Lord and spoke of him to all them that looked for redemption into Jerusalem hallelujah God is so good unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government the government the rulership of not only your life and my life, but of the whole world is upon his shoulder and he will have his way in the end. Notice his name is called Wonderful because he's a wonderful God. His name is called Counselor because he will counsel you. Listen to his voice this weekend. He is the mighty God. He's the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So I want to encourage you again. Be watchful. 
Be thankful. Be hopeful. May you have a merry, blessed, peaceful, joyful Christmas. And an amazing, exceeding, abundant, above all you could ask or imagine 2024 according to his power that's at work in you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Choose joy. Celebrate joy. Choose peace. Let peace rule in your heart. Celebrate peace. Choose thankfulness. Celebrate Jesus, God's special, precious, priceless gift to us. Merry Christmas. God bless you. Enjoy your food. Enjoy your time with your family. And choose Christ. Choose peace. I love you. Should he say the same? I will speak with you Thursday. God bless you. Merry Christmas.